Welcome everyone to our last virtual digital economy seminar in this spring semester. It's as always a great pleasure to welcome all of you here. Our uh, moderator for today will be Daniel Irshoff at the Toulouse School of Economics and he will introduce today's speaker in, a, in a, less than a second. I'm just here to give you some organizational details as always and uh, so importantly if you have any clarifying questions throughout the talk please send these to everyone in the chat window so that Daniel can interrupt the speaker at a convenient time and allow you to ask a question directly or ask it for you if you prefer. We will also collect questions for the Q&A in the same way, so don't hesitate to send questions via the chat. Today's session will be recorded, so if you do ask a question yourself, you will appear in the recording on YouTube. All right, very happy to hand over to Daniel. Great, thanks a lot, Hannes. Uh, yeah, so today we're very happy uh, to have Dan Coyle from the Bennett Institute for Public Policy and from the University of Cambridge uh, to talk to us about um, free digital goods and uh, how to measure them and what they mean for economic welfare. So I'll just hand over uh, the screen to Diane. Thanks very much and hello everybody. So I'm very grateful for the invitation to present this paper today. It's particularly timely because um, we would like to get it submitted. So. Um, I would really welcome any comments that you have, obviously during the seminar, but also if you want to email me afterwards, that would be fantastic. Um, I want to start with our motivation for thinking about this question. And the context for our research question is, is the beyond GDP debate really. And um, the issues that people have been raising in the context of GDP measurement and economic welfare measurement about these free digital goods for which we, we pay for devices, we pay for uh, data plans, um, but the services themselves are, have a zero monetary price. And in that sense, they're similar to other types of uh, free, zero price public goods, um, such as environmental goods or cultural goods. And uh, the debate in particular has been gaining momentum because of a sense that the wedge between what GDP is measuring and aggregate economic welfare has been growing. So I've put here a, a, a nice paper by Richard Hayes and colleagues thinking about what we measure in the aggregate as a spectrum from the private market economy through GDP, through wider and wider concepts of economic welfare. So we wanted to uh, try a contingent valuation approach, uh, essentially surveying people to ask what, they, uh, what values they state for these goods using a large representative survey to elicit willingness to accept measures. And I just want to dwell on the methodology because there's a, a rapidly growing literature on um, estimating the consumer surplus associated with free digital goods. So for example, a range of papers on Facebook now, they're asking somewhat different kinds of research question um, in many cases. So for example, they might be asking about causal interventions or about structural parameters pertaining to preferences. Our question and method are, are, are somewhat different. Um, it's about uh, this aggregate assessment of what's happening to welfare in the economy. So we opted for a large scale survey methodology and um, uh, there's a, a interest in, um, among others in pursuing the same kind of methodology. I know that Thomas Philippon and Anse have been think thinking about this, Kevin Fox in, in Sydney thinking about this uh, approach as well. We were particularly lucky, David and I, uh, and my co-authors, David Nian, now at the OECD, in that we um, uh, ran a survey just before the first lockdown and were then able to run successive waves, which I'll, I'll talk about. But that gave us uh, um, an unwelcome in one sense, but also in, for met methodologically very useful uh, natural experiment in this methodology. And so some of what I'm going to talk about today concerns the switches between the different time periods at which, at which we post the, the surveys. Obviously life is moving online and uh, these uh, the data on the left come from the Ofcom about the hours spent online in the UK. Some of us on this call will think really only four hours a day so that's obviously an average um, but if you add that over the week it's more than a day a week uh, since the first lockdown. The panel on the right indicates what the most popular sites are that people visit. This is obviously um, a very uneven distribution. Google properties and Facebook properties, as in most markets, are the dominant ones and take up most of that time that people spend online. So I think the only 
UK origin one there. And again, this is UK data is the BBC. Um, so um, obviously contingent valuation methodology has um, a history of being strongly criticized. Jerry Hausman in particular has been vocal about the limited usefulness of, um, of the method. And I will end today with some questions about its applicability, having talked about what we learned from it through the course of the, the presentation. But I was very persuaded by a paper by Alan Blinder from 1991, where he said, if we're not going to use this kind of method, then we need to come up with some other kind of method. We can't talk about externalities in the context of the environment or similar contexts, unless we're willing as economists to, fight, to provide some empirical method for estimating for estimating what's really a very significant phenomenon, whether you're talking about the environment or you're talking about digital goods. And I think it's worth reminding everybody that actually in collecting na na national statistics that we all use all the time and download without, without a thought, many of those are survey based as well. They're just different types of question and survey. So we started this process a couple of years ago with a series of pilots. And here I set out for you the waves and the number of people involved the pilots um, uh, were trying to test whether we should use different bands of values or leave the questions open, what bands we should use, having decided to, to opt for that, that approach, what kind of time period to ask about, um, weeks, months, uh, years, or even longer periods, what range of goods and how to describe the goods in the surveys. And uh, we worked with colleagues in ONS in their surveys division to test the questionnaires as well. Um, so the pilots were um, through 2019. The first wave, 10,500 adults, so a large sample uh, in early, end of February, early March 2020. When the pandemic hit, we got permission to go ahead with a smaller wave in May and then uh, a repeat full wave again a year on in February 2021. The sample is representative of the uh, online adult population. Uh, for those who are not aficionados of UK politics, the UK includes Northern Ireland and GB excludes Northern Ireland. So this um, sample excludes Northern Ireland and which is one um, probably modest bias. Uh, the bigger bias will come from it being the online population because it's the YouGov online panel. Um, and that's why we give here some demographic information it suggests to me that it's actually not that unrepresentative except for income. The income average there is higher than the um, average in the population as a whole, which is what you'd expect. You'd expect people not online to be somewhat um, poorer, probably somewhat older. Um, all that, that isn't so evident in this sample. Um, just to show you an example of the kinds of questions people were posed, they were presented with this menu. The bands, um, we asked for about one month and 12 months, and the bands here are designed to um, elicit a full enough distribution of responses uh, based on the pilot uh, responses that we got. And we selected 30 goods, which I will tell you about in a moment. And these were presented in random order to participants in the survey. Um, uh, I should add, people were not paid for taking part in the survey. Um, they, they accumulate points. If they're a member of the panel, they accumulate points and they can spend those at some, some time, but they need to do quite a lot of surveys to get very much money. And so here is the timeline, just to repeat that. Um, so wave one was before we in the UK heard very much about COVID and um, a few days before the Italian lockdown and three weeks before the UK lockdown. And then we were able to, as I said, do these repeat waves. The question was what goods to select. In the literature, there's a lot of attention on Facebook in particular for obvious reasons, but we wanted to look at a range of digital goods. But we also wanted to look at, to make some comparisons. And um, so some of, the, some of the choices are obvious, such as Facebook and Twitter but we looked at um, online news versus printed newspapers, for example, online entertainment services versus TV sets, cinema and radio, uh, some niche apps, so the mobility apps, and um, uh, the uh, public parks is an example of a non-digital free public good um, about which there's some evidence in the environmental economics literature. 
And then um, I, for one, had never heard of Zoom a little while ago, um, though we didn't include it in the 2020 survey. Um, uh, so we added Zoom and TikTok in 2021. So there is a new goods problem in trying this kind of approach. Um, and I have to say that the choice of the non-digital public good was, was a lucky one because my phone is going and now the answer phone is going. I'm terribly sorry. Um, uh, we didn't know that public parks were going to be uh, so important um, during lockdowns. So that was just a, a, a random selection, if you like, to see what, how the comparison turned out. And that, as it happened, was very lucky. So it could be evident what kind of data we got from the surveys. And this gives you an example for three of the 30 products. So we get a proportion of respondents selecting uh, the willingness to accept bans. The question to remind you is how much would you be willing to accept to give up access for either one month or 12 months for each of these goods? And we get these distributions in each case. And um, the pattern is uh, often, although not always, that there are many people who choose the lowest band, and many people, or another um, peak of people choosing the highest band, and less in between. So the distributional issues here are going to be quite interesting to think about. So you get there's density at high and low bands, and in some cases, some of the super users, as it were, uh, are really high value users indeed. And so the medians are going to be uh, as important as the means, but you can see from these examples, and these are 12 month figures, that the means are quite high. And this is consistent, again, with some of the other literature. Um, so to give an example of how this changed between February 2020 and February 21, what I've given you here is the median uh, where each of the 30 products sits, um, uh, where the median band of each of the 30 products sits. The black is February 2020. The red shows significant changes between February 2020 and February 21. And um, so these are completely intuitive. Netflix and Amazon move up to another band in terms of median willingness to accept. Radio drops a band, public parks move up a band as well between 2020 and 2021. And then the two new entrants, TikTok and Zoom, um, uh, come into that one pound to 100 pound category for, um, for medians. Um, and so, um, they're all, the niche products are the least used products. So I should say um, the, there's a strong correlation between usage, proportion of the sample using each product and the median and mean valuations. So the higher the usage, completely intuitively, the higher the value that, that gets stated. Um, um, Diane, quick, quick, so two, two questions. So one is a clarification question. Um, did you ask about the intensity of usage? Of the so we don't know. We don't know how much how much time each person spends using. It. It's just do they use it? And, and then the other, uh, I guess it's a comment from Christos uh, Janakos uh, that there's no, there doesn't seem to be a movement in terms of online learning. So there's no change in the. I'm going to come back to that. No, there wasn't, um, except in certain subgroups. Because we got a very large representative sample, we did some um, demographic analysis, and I've got a slide about that a little bit later. So um, online learning is one that does change for a certain subgroup, and I'll pick that out in a later slide. That's a great question. Um, any other questions, Anil, or shall I carry on? Uh, no other questions at the moment. Um, so where have I got to? So again, sticking with the impact of the changes, um, there's a positive correlation here again, as you can see, between uh, the change in usage over the pandemic and the change in stated values. And um, that's again, completely intuitive. Um, so yes, here's, here's the point. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> there, are, there are some very strong demographic changes in here. Online groceries, that went up significantly across the board, but for older people, there was an even larger change. And similarly for older people, um, the value of the stated value of Facebook increased significantly also. So one imagines that 
they were lesser users or less intense users than some younger cohorts uh, and discovered uh, the importance of social media, perhaps. Um, online learning, um, to go back to that example, very big increase indeed for people in um, the social category E in the classifications that uh, we are using UK data, uh, but not for the average. So um, uh, it, in that sense, is, a, is um, a niche product fitting a particular need for a particular category of people. Um, for, there were gen very strong gender differences in any case, and that's in the paper, I haven't put it in the slides, but for women, there were significant increases for these three categories, games, online learning, and, and LinkedIn. Um, public parks, big increases for younger age groups, decline for older age groups. Uh, and again, this is speculation, but perhaps because older age groups were less likely to go out, at least in that early phase of the pandemic. And uh, then um, news is an interesting example, which I'm going to go on to talk about in a bit more detail. One of the categories that we chose to be able to compare online and offline equivalents or a marketed equivalent. And uh, here are some of the summary statistics from that. These are um, mean um, willingness to accept, stated willingness to accept for a 12 month period. So the first two lines here give you the change from February 2020 to February 21. And um, that's for online. And there's um, some decline uh, uh, for the young age group and some increase for the older age groups. Printed news is the bottom two lines over that same period. And that's both significantly lower than for online news in any case, uh, and also has um, big declines in the stated willingness to accept across the board. So it's quite interesting to think about what's going on here. We've got a pattern where in any case, willingness to accept a loss is greater, much greater online than offline. Um, prices are greater offline than online. We know that use of uh, readership of printed newspapers has been declining substantially over time. That's been quite a strong trend. And uh, there's a, if you compare willingness to accept from the survey with the subscription prices that people pay for both online and offline news, there's, uh, there's quite a gap. This is um, completely standard in the contingent valuation literature. The gap between willingness to pay and willingness to accept measures is often large. And it's much bigger here for online than offline. Um, so just to give, give some other figures, the um, in February 2021, 74% of the sample were reading news online and a median willingness to accept of £150, which hadn't changed over the period, although the mean changed a little, as you can see here. And 49% were reading printed newspapers declined from 55% a year earlier, before the pandemic, and a median willingness to accept that declined from the 50 pound band to the 10 pound band. And um, there's also this quite strong age skew in news. So um, it's another quite interesting example that I don't think there is a really good handle on about why the gap between willingness to accept and willingness to pay is so large when you're talking about um, not even free digital goods, you, you can pay for online newspapers. And also the gap between online and offline doesn't seem to be so much about price as about some other amenities associated with online reading. And I think that would be a really interesting area to explore further. Um, uh, there's, there's one quick question that I, I think we'll, um, we'll play into what, what you just said is, um, is, there, is there a difference between um, mobile and wired access like is that something that you've measured and, and looked at so. um yes we do have the data and um i have to say i haven't looked into it very much yet there are some systematic differences between people who reply using mobile and people who reply using um uh desk, laptop or desktop if that's the if that's the question um one of the, the there's a very rich um uh possibility of doing more exploration of the demographics here, which we, we haven't got around to yet, and we'll do in a, we'll do in a later paper. And, and there's also a question from Shane, uh, Shane Greenstein. Shane, do you want to unmute yourself and, and you, you could ask uh, the question? Hello, Shane. Okay, perhaps uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just ask you for it. 
Um, do you see any um, correlation between willingness to accept and working from home? Is that, is that something that, that comes up in, in, in some of the... We didn't ask about whether people were working from home. The, the kind of information we have about them, it's uh, age, um, their gender, uh, region of the country, um, voting preferences among political parties, and also I think we have Brexit and Remain, um, uh, which kind of device did they answer on, uh, education level and occupational grade. Can I, uh, I, I now unmuted. Uh, uh, sorry about that. I wasn't allowed initially. Uh, well, that one other thing you might be able to do is uh, uh, occupation is heavily correlated with uh, ability to work from home. So perhaps uh, do you see something there? That, that's a really good point, Shane. Thank you. If we had designed the survey in February 2021 to run in February 2020, I'm sure we'd have asked that. But when we designed it, we didn't know what was about to happen. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, any other questions at the moment, Daniel? Uh, no other questions at the moment. Um, so you can construct implied demand curves um, from the data that we have. So at, for example, at um, zero stated willingness to accept, 28% of people uh, don't use Facebook and 72% of people are using Facebook. Um, Another 21% of the distribution require between one and a hundred pounds to give up Facebook for 12 months. Um, so for up to a hundred pounds, 51% taking the aggregate would consume uh, Facebook and 49% would not. So you can work in this way to build up these Im implied demand curves. And I've given you a few examples here. We've done this for all of them and for each of the three waves. So the illustrations show you, first of all, the big shift for online grocery shopping, for example, and a smaller shift to Facebook, actually much less for online search. I should say that two of these products really stand out as having different characteristics from all of the others, and that's online search and personal email. Uh, the usage is much higher, the stated values are high, uh, the means and the median, and um, they didn't shift very much, as you can see, between waves because people are already using these um, an awful lot. And um, they've got somewhat different shapes also, these curves. And a note of caution, these are not demand curves as we're normally used to thinking about them. The normal thought experiment is that you're looking at a marginal change in price and how that change is quantity demanded. What we're doing here is looking at changes in um, price equivalent willingness to accept for non-marginal changes in quantity. And so, um, the steeper the curve, the more elastic in that sense. So it's counterintuitive in, in that sense. Um, but nevertheless, you can use the areas under these curves to estimate consumer surplus as you, um, as you um, might with any other demand curves. Um, having said that, there's a real adding up question here that I want to come back to later um, because as in other work in this evolving literature, we get very large estimates for consumer surplus. And, um, and yet there's no adding up constraint. And that's one of the issues, the real issues I think that I'll return to uh, in discussion at the end about using this kind of, this kind of methodology. Um, so I'm talking about the socioeconomic differences um, and here are just some of the headlines and again, all the details in the paper, which I think um, has been circulated. Um, big differences across age, gender, and social grade, younger people, and, and again, these are very intuitive and um, not surprising. So younger people value some of the social media products more, same with TikTok, um, older people for non-digital ones. Uh, there is quite a gender skew for all of the um, different products, and we've got a chart in the paper that shows that. So. Uh, for women, it's um, stronger for on online groceries and Instagram, for men, LinkedIn and, and Twitter. And that too is consistent with other literature about um, uh, gender usage of the different kinds of services. Um, for most of the products, there is a, a gradient in terms of uh, social oc occupational status, um, but some of them actually are valued by um, all uh, the social the social grades, um, and I've just given some examples here. 
But as I said, there is a lot more work that we can do and uh, hope to do in future looking at these, these um, uh, individual differences. And in particular, we were able to track some of the same individuals who answered all three ways of the survey. I've forgotten the exact number of people uh, uh, in that group, but certainly it's a, a large sample for February 2020 to February 2021. I think it's a third of the sample and um, we will be able to do some more work with those. At the moment, we've just used regressions using these characteristics as a robustness check on, on the simple correlations. And um, luckily they, they seem to stand up. Um, another robustness check was some best worth scaling questions at the end of the survey. And um, there's a randomized uh, uh, set of suggestions and people have to say which they'd be most and least willing to give up. And that set narrows down and the um, uh, Facebook and Wikipedia, as it says here, were the first to go and personal email and the sum of money offered in the um, test was the uh, last to go. So again, personal email uh, emerges as having really quite different demand characteristics than some of the others. Um, not only niche products, uh, you could argue that online learning is a niche product, but, but also some quite popular social media platforms and, and um, like, like Facebook. Um, so yes, I'm, I did talk about this already a little bit, the gap between willingness to accept and willingness to pay, uh, very large in these cases. And uh, we don't have willingness to pay figures. So the comparison is with the average revenue per user from Ofcom data uh, as an indicator of the ballpark of what willingness to pay might be. And you can see that it's that's not, not just smaller, but orders of mag magnitude smaller. And again, I think that that's a long-standing puzzle that has not been answered in the literature. There are some time inconsistencies. Um, we randomized the sample in terms of asking about one month or 12 months. And in most of the cases, as you can see from the chart on the right here, the monthly valuations multiplied by 12 are lower than the annual valuations. And we don't really know why that is. It's interesting to speculate, but um, uh, I don't have the answer. Is it that people are overvaluing short periods or undervaluing longer ones? Is it something about the thought process that you go through when being asked to give up something you use for a relatively short period versus a relatively long period? And um, there are just a few that are quotes time consistent in this sense, email, TV, groceries, games, and search. And I have no idea why it should be those or what explains the divergence um, between the pattern that we see here. Uh, again, it's something that it might be interesting to think about in some future work. Um, and, and the ending up question um, that I just started to talk about already. So think back to those demand curves and the consumer surplus. I gave the example of Facebook in the slide and uh, there are 57 million UK adults. 72% based on our sample are using, have a non-zero willingness to accept giving up Facebook for a 12 month period, median is 150 pounds. If you aggregate that up, you get 6 billion, which is a lot of money. But it really raises the question about both the categorization of the goods that you ask about and the range that you should include. If you're thinking about this, as I said, in terms of what's the aggregate wedge in economic welfare created by these free digital goods. We selected the goods um, really by um, thinking about usage. We looked at usage figures to see which were most popular and um, some sense of what was interesting in the literature. So it wasn't, um, there was no um, aggregation or accounting framework for it. Um, we thought about categories uh, in the sense of uh, should we, ask about social media or should we ask about Facebook and Twitter separately? And again, if um, a, a separate um, service such as Facebook had a lot of users, we included it separately. But if it was um, a broader um, service with no um, high usage for any individual example, then we use the category. So online maps would be an example there. And um, so there's a question about the category level which of those is the correct one? And what's the universe of goods that we should be including here? 
I said we included public parks just as um, a way of thinking about the comparison between a non-digital free good and all these digital free goods. But if public parks, why not um, clean air or um, having a nice garden in your house or any other butterflies, any other environmental good or any of the um, uh, free zero price monetary goods um, that we pay for through our taxes rather than paying for directly, this is exactly the same. So if you're thinking about it in terms of the aggregate welfare question, that universe of goods to start including in these, these sorts of surveys is a pretty key question to ask why we're picking digital ones in particular. And then fundamentally for me, what's the budget constraint? Um, there are, even though they're free, people don't use all of them. And um, the natural budget to think about is the time budget because uh, that's not uh, an inequality as a monetary budget would be. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute identity. You use your 24 hours. And um, so I think in some way we need to combine this kind of approach with time use data. And one of the questions right at the beginning was, did we ask about intensity of use? And the answer was, no, we didn't. Um, but we are getting time use data here about the um, amount of time that people spend on digital activities of different kinds. So there's a possibility of work in future that will marry up that time use data with this kind of stated value data to um, impose a budget constraint, a time budget constraint. And this is um, an area that I started thinking about with um, Lennon Nakamura and, and David Nian also, and another future avenue that we would like to pursue. Um, Dan, there's a question from Adrian Stoven. Uh, let me just, I'll ask him to unmute and then he can ask it. Um, it's about willingness to accept versus willingness to pay. Yeah, so this is a fairly general question. So I, I was wondering, it, it seemed that these questions in the surveys are always asked in willing to, to accept form. So how much uh, do you need to be paid in order to give up? Would the answers change if instead they would be asked in willingness uh, to pay for them with? So uh, how much would you be willing to pay in order to have continued access to Facebook, for example? Um, the, the answers would be different. And um, from memory, the, the Cass Sunstein did take that approach uh, specifically about Facebook in his paper and got, again, that quite large wedge between willingness to pay and willingness to accept. But I suppose in a sense, you can tell from the business models of the digital platforms, that those that offer both options, the people who opt to take the subscription model are a minority of their user base. I think for Spotify, for instance, it's 10% pay for a subscription of 10 pounds a month here and 90% who opt for the free advertising supported, um, advertising -supported model. And, um, I'm not sure whether this is just because we've got used to it or whether there's some psychological mechanism um, going on here. And the finding of the wedge is consistent across the contingent valuation literature, uh, whether it's environmental goods, cultural goods, or now free digital goods. And as I said earlier, I don't think anybody's really got to the bottom of it. For me, it, it does require thinking about the psychological mechanisms and we don't have any theory um, trying to model um, what's driving that, that, that large gap. Can I ask a short follow-up question maybe? Danny? So I, I was also, so when you talk about categories, uh, a lot seems to depend on how uh, or whether closed substitutes are available for a product. So if for example, Facebook or Google, they have considerable market power so you're willing, uh, not really willing to give up uh, Google search because there's no alternative that increases your uh, willingness to accept value, but does it then also automatically increase the welfare that you derive from, from Google search? So how to disentangle welfare from market power issues? Yeah, of course, and that's true um, in the conventional statistics anyway. Um, because a lot of the assumptions you make about GDP's relevance to economic welfare do assume that prices are set competitively and there are no monopoly rents. So I think from, I'm pretty sure that we just asked about search. We didn't specify Google search. Uh, whereas with social media, we asked about the different social media platforms separately. Um, 
of course, most people do use Google search, you're, you're quite right. But my sense is that it's the, um, the, the, you know, the characteristics of the service itself, rather than the fact that it's Google that, that drives a lot of the high stated values for that. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, uh, Yossi has a question. Uh, Yossi, uh, have a, um, you're mute, you're gonna ask it. Yeah, I guess uh, my question is, uh, do we know how good the estimates are in the sense that uh, if you really had to pay people, would the sums that you would have to pay them not to use the goods would be anywhere near the, uh, the numbers that people write down? Um, some of the literature um, takes the form of incentive compatible experiments where payments are made. And as I said, that's not the approach that we were um, taking deliberately in um, this paper. Having said that, I don't think there's any obvious reason for strategic bias in people's response to the questions that we posed here. Um, you know, they, they got a, a bland description of what the purpose of the survey was and um, this, this randomized set of questions about how much would they need to be paid? If there were going to be a bias, I would expect it to be um, consistent across goods in a, in a way. But again, to go back to the point I just made to Adrian, we don't actually know or have a model of the thought process that people go through when they're answering these kinds of questions. That there seems to me to be a gap for bringing together some of the uh, some psychology and um, what kind of theory you might have about people's mental processes as they think about these, these goods and uh, the numbers that they, they then state. And um, perhaps I've missed something, but I haven't seen that um, kind of marriage of approaches and a development of a theory anywhere in the, in the literature. Um, so this we didn't do that kind of incentive compatible work, but I don't think there was any particular reason for strategic bias in the answers that people gave us. Thanks. And then Victoria, I think, also has a comment or a question about um, willingness to accept versus willingness to pay. Oh, uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, I think she, she mentioned that uh, willingness to accept is greater than willingness to pay is found to be narrow with familiarity of the goods um, for unique environmental and cultural goods. So probably the frequency of engagement is, is important. That's the, the comment. Um, and then I actually, um, I had a question which, uh, whether the, the differences in valuations that you found for some of the products are different from the US ones um, in other surveys and to what extent and what, what does that mean? Whether maybe that's a way of, of trying to disentangle some of the, the market structure effects because there are differences in European usage versus North American usage of different digital products. So one of the, maybe it's the next slide, um, one of the things I think it would be great to see would be more um, countries and uh, groups of goods being tested in this way, because you're exactly right, it does help you um, ad address like, that kind of question. So th there's quite a lot on the US. Um, most of it is a, a different kind of methodology rather than large scale representative surveys. And as I said right at the start, I'm aware of a couple of people who are interested in doing these for other countries, but it would be great to see uh, more of that done. And um, you know, start to get a handle on some of the differences that are emerging in the literature. Because I don't, I don't think it's a very consistent story. So what I think we find is um, some of these results are really intuitive and um, comforting in that sense. Uh, people have a hierarchy. Uh, there's a positive correlation between stated values and usage. The changes that we saw with our natural experiment were in understandable directions. And so there's nothing obviously, um, uh, there's no obvious reason why we shouldn't be thinking about developing this kind of methodology. And as I said, right at the start, I do think we need an empirical approach to this kind of question as, you know, we can't just shrug our shoulders as economists and say, sorry, can't be, can't be done. Um, but as well as the cross country comparisons or trying different kinds of goods or different hierarchies of goods um, to get at some of these substitution questions, um, this accounting framework and adding up and adding up rule, I think, is really important. 
and uh, the universe of goods that we should be thinking about. And then also these distributional questions. We haven't got into the distributional issues very much in very much detail yet. But if you are thinking about a welfare framework rather than a market value framework, which ostensibly GDP does, then you've got to think about distributions too. There is uh, some work going on now about distributional uh, GDP or um, you know, democratic GDP measures, um, but you really can't talk about aggregate welfare without thinking about the distributional issues. And some of that has been really highlighted by the pandemic. So in response to um, the question from Christoph earlier, that, that big increase in access to online learning for people in the lowest occupational grade that we saw on an earlier slide, that's, a, that's the kind of result that would be, become really important for thinking about aggregating up from the survey results that we have to some aggregate measure. Um, and that's it, that's my, my slides. So I think I'll stop sharing so that we can see each other on the screen. Um, if the slides aren't available already, uh, there are a few references here and a few um, slides about pilots and so on for information. And I think everybody had the paper as well. Great, thanks Dan, this is really great. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, let's let's open up the discussion. Uh, so I think if uh, perhaps if anyone wants to um, sit, ask any questions or, or make comments or anything like that, feel free to. Hopefully, you'll be able to unmute yourself, um, and uh, we can go ahead. Um, I, I actually, so I, I guess my let me just ask the first kind of lead, leading question is um, whether. You have thoughts about how how would you have designed the survey or the next wave of the survey after COVID or, or given kind of the COVID experiences or some of the kind of fundamental changes um, during the pandemic, whether whether you would have designed it differently or, or how should we think about surveys now? Um, I haven't thought about the distributional question before we ran the survey. And so there might be other um, uh, characteristics to include. Um, as I said, we had about half a dozen. Uh, working from home, Shane already raised that, would have been a great one to include if we had known about it already. So I, I think his suggestion about how to take that forward is a really great one. And um, I hadn't thought as much beforehand about the new goods problem. I mean, obviously, if you're trying to calculate real GDP, introducing new goods into the deflator that you use is a well-known uh, well problem. And I haven't thought about how you have a frame, develop a framework for um, new goods in, in this sort of universe of um, uh, you know, survey questions about, about free zero monetary price goods. Um, but there will be some kind of answer needed about when you introduce new goods and um, how to weight those in an aggregate if you're really thinking about developing an aggregate. I think Larry, Larry uh, unmuted himself. So yeah, a couple of things. Um, I don't know how difficult it would be to go back to the slide uh, showing the differences between the monthly and the annual values, because I, I, it was hard for me to reconcile what I think you were saying uh, to what I thought I was seeing on the, oops, uh, I don't know, it may be more difficult um, so sorry carry on talking and I'll try and get it up <laughs> all right um, well first uh, ah there we go all right uh, monthly valuations times 12 are lower than annual valuations I, but do people overvalue short period I, I thought you were telling us they over that the monthly was times 12 was greater than the annual. Uh, so can you um, say what, what's there again? So I probably just got those the wrong way around, Larry. So um, from the chart, it's clear that 12 times a month is less than a year in most cases. So it right. should, under an overvalue should be the other way around. So you're eagle-eyed to have spotted that. Hey, you know, journal editor and all that. Um, all right, so I can imagine 
you know, you ask me to go without something for a month and, uh, you know, sure, I can do that. Ask me to go for a year, man, that just seems like a much bigger uh, uh, hardship, which might be part of this uh, you know, non-adding up uh, phenomenon. Yeah, but I, that, that seems really uh, intuitive and that takes you to the debate about what form of discounting do people use uh, in the behavioral literature. Um, so then I, I, I completely accept that as a potential argument, but then I don't really understand the difference between the different goods and why it is that for a few goods there's there's consistency. So in other words, why why do you apply different forms of discounting to different types of, yeah. of goods? Let's see if that's the story. Yeah. yeah. This has been a, you know, a completely fascinating exercise that has, uh, I suppose, like all the most interesting research, generated many more questions than it's actually answered. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Stop sharing again now. Uh, Brian, Brian Cowan had a, uh, a question. Brian. Uh, yes, uh, Diane, I wanted to ask if you had any observations about the difference in values between the Brinsholfson work in the US and uh, your results. And I was particularly interested in the inversion at the high end between uh, email and search, which were the most valuable in both studies, but inverted. And I, I also, I might have missed something in the discussion, but as I recall, the Brinch-Olfson work actually tried to enforce the, the uh, de deprivation for a very small percentage uh, to see if uh, that made any difference. And I can't remember what the result was, but you didn't do that as I understand. No, no, we didn't do that. We wanted to use these large scale surveys. So it's a, a different approach and um, the, the the budget, the research budget did not extend to paying 10 and a half thousand people. Um, so it, I don't think it's surprising that you would get that kind of, um, I put this in quotes, but relative price difference between different economies because the structures, the market structures are somewhat different and um, you know the preferences may be different and the uh, universe of goods that people are thinking about might be different as well. So I don't think that gap or that inversion is um, is anything really surprising. It's not not um, not a big deal in the data in either case. Um, but you know, to go back to the point that came up a little while ago, I think cross country comparisons would be really useful. And uh, so, if more people are thinking about doing this kind of surveys, um, that would be great. And if anybody on the call today um, would like to talk about it, I'm really happy to talk about about how we went about it. Great, uh, thanks. Can I ask Sorry. a question? Uh, yeah, first, go ahead. Uh, what is the main takeaway from uh, from the study? I, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, so my, my main takeaway is that this has real potential as a means of estimating consumer surplus from um, these kinds of goods. The surveys are straightforward to run. Um, there's a lot of experience in statistical agencies in running these surveys. They're not too costly. And so if we care about measuring economic welfare, as opposed to measuring, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of mishmash of things that we get in real GDP, then this is um, a very valuable way to think about doing it. And the so, other take- so, so, the so the contribution is methodological, namely showing that uh, this uh, methodology uh, is a reasonable one to, to use, or is there any message about public goods? Um, I think part of the message is about um, the how you think about welfare at a time of actually quite extraordinary um, change and distribution. And so the distributional questions um, haven't come up very much in the beyond GDP literature. Um, so there's you know, there, there are interesting findings from having the natural experiment of the, of the COVID lockdowns as well. I've just spotted that David is actually on the call. I don't know if you want to add anything, David. Oh, uh, no, thanks. No, I'm 
No, I'm, just, I'm trying to add some stuff in the chat. So. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I, actually, I have a question about, um, so one of the things that, that may be possible to do with this sort of methodology is to think about the combination of different services. Uh, and I'm especially thinking about like Facebook. So we use Facebook on its own, but we also use Facebook to log into other kind of digital services. And so do you think it's possible to kind of ask about different combination, like how would you value you know, Facebook and something else or, 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 or these sort of combinations of different products or even Facebook and Instagram, right? Like thinking about um, you know, products that are co-owned by the same company. Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, I'd need to think about it some more because I think, um, you know, actually some qualitative work, understanding better how people think about the different services might be quite illuminating. Um, and the extent to which they do have separate, you know, very clearly separate um, products in mind in the way that if you're thinking about standard marketed goods, you understand quite different, quite clearly the difference between, um, you know, the, the, the different things that you're buying. There, there is, as you say, much more overlap here. Uh, and so I think it's part of the adding up question actually, Daniel, and it's something I need to think about more. Thanks, Dan. And Michael, Michael Ward has a question, Michael. If you want to... uh, just the one thing to get the magnitudes in, in order is it, you've got a increase in the willingness to accept for these online groceries, for example, but can you compare that to say the increase in the revenue that is being generated by the industry or the increase in the market capitalization that the firms are, are capturing from this increased uh, uh, consumer surplus, just to see you know, how, how much of this is being appropriated. Um, I haven't done that. We could. That's a really good idea. So we can we can definitely do that. And um, I, I guess the point is that there's a presumption that's not just getting um, your groceries and eating them that's delivering the consumer surplus. There are characteristics of the service, such as in this case, not having to go to the store, um, that have a separate value. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good idea. We can do that. Um, that's great. Uh, so is there anyone else uh, with a question or a comment um, that would like to, so feel free to, to unmute yourself and then. Um... Okay, great. So if there, um, is there anything else, then, um, then we'll, we should uh, probably close the session. So thank you very much, Diane. This is really great um, project. Uh, if you think of anything later, please do email me, as I said, or email David, because um, we um, would welcome um, either on this paper or ideas for future work, or if you want to do anything of the kind yourself and would like to talk to us about it, please get in touch.